Well, good morning, everyone. I'm so glad to be here. As you know, I, had, I was off last Sunday, and I missed you all dearly. It's not the same as uh, when, when I'm not here. I, I, uh, I love being here with you all. So I'm glad to be here this morning, and I feel uh, energized and, and rejuvenated and just so glad to be here. So I'm, uh, I, we're continuing into, into the uh, season of Lent, which is, of course is that season when we are uh, preparing for, uh, for Easter. And I, I told you I was going to try to come up with some interesting facts about Lent, some things that uh, I, I didn't realize. And last time I think I shared with you that Lent is, oh, is the word in Latin that means spring. Another thing, I, how many days is Lent? Does anybody know? 40. I think if we counted them up, though, there's actually more than 40 because actually Sundays don't count in Lent, believe it or not. Sundays are actually celebrations like many Easter's all throughout Lent. So actually, if we were to look from the beginning of Lent until Easter, there are actually more than 40 days, and that's because of the Sundays, this special day when we come and we are reminded of Easter, even in the midst of Lent. Even in the midst of Lent, we come on Sunday and we are already celebrating our risen Lord. We are already being reminded of what Jesus has done for us on the cross. And also, we are reminded of the promises of Christ, which we are examining now in our series as we go through Lent. So today, let's celebrate that. Let's celebrate that we are here to celebrate our risen Lord. Uh, and before we continue our worship and before we have our call to worship, I, uh, just a few announcements. Another announcement, uh, a few weeks ago I mentioned how during Lent often fasting is something that people have done. It's a practice uh, that people have, uh, have undertaken through the centuries. And there was a presentation on, on uh, fasting, there's a video presentation, and uh, some of us are going to uh, meet virtually on, on Thursday evening to talk about that. So if there's anyone who's interested in knowing more about that, about fasting, about what that means, or you're, you just have some questions, uh, feel free to give me a call or text me or email me, and I'll be happy to share that video with you, and uh, if you'd like to join us for that conversation, uh, you're more than welcome. I'm, I'm excited to talk about that and delve in a little more. So this morning, uh, we're going to be talking specifically, again, we're going through a series on Jesus' last words to his disciples, the things that he promises to his disciples as uh, he's about to go to the cross. And I was thinking about uh, this, this morning, one of the things that, uh, the main thing we'll be talking about is that Jesus promises the Holy Spirit. And as I was thinking about the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is talked about all through the scriptures. And one of the places that I th uh, God gave me to think about this week was in Ezekiel 36, the prophet Ezekiel. Uh, the prophet Ezekiel says this, or through God, For I will take you out of the nations. I will gather you from the countries and bring you back into your own land. I will sprinkle clean water on you and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your impurities and from all your idols. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. Your hearts of I will remove your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. As we come this morning, I see this twofold promise that is here in Ezekiel, just promised way back in the Old Testament and, uh, to the people of Israel. And Jesus promises those same things, that he will cleanse us from all impurities and that he gives us his Holy Spirit. So as we celebrate those things this morning, let's come to God in a time of prayer uh, as we begin our worship together. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, God, we thank you for this place. We thank you for this Sunday, the Sunday even when we celebrate Easter, even though it's not Easter yet. The Sunday when we can come and we can worship you and adore you. We thank you for the promise of cleansing in Christ. We thank you, Lord, for the promise of the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, we pray that you be with us now as we worship and adore you, triune God. Be with us now as we hear your uh, word and sing your praises and, uh, and pray and uh, and reflect on what you've done for us. I pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I invite you to rise in body or in spirit to receive God's greeting. To those who have been called and who are kept by God the Father, grace, mercy, and peace be yours in abundance. Amen. You may be seated. 
Let's take a few moments to quietly reflect and, and prepare our hearts in, in prayer and meditation as we, uh, as we prepare to, uh, to worship our God further. I was wondering if anyone is familiar with that tune that Carol's been playing during our, our moments of reflection and meditation. Does anybody know that tune? Nobody. All right. Well, my hope is that uh, I, I, that's one of my favorite songs, actually. And so Carol has uh, been gracious enough to, to play it because uh, for me, I, I love this song. It's called Beneath the Cross of Jesus. And not the, not, I know many of you are maybe familiar with a, another song, Beneath the Cross of Jesus, but this is a song that's uh, really about Easter, about Easter and Jesus being uh, on the cross, and that's where we find our place to stand, and that we are sinners who are chasing hopeless dreams, and Jesus and God find us as we are, and we find our place beneath the cross of Jesus. So I encourage you this week, uh, this is, I guess, my invitation, sharing something with you that I enjoy and appreciate. I love that song. It's called Beneath the Cross of Jesus. If you're looking for a song to listen to, uh, just go on YouTube, look that up. And that's the song that Carol's played for a number of weeks now. But the tune is beautiful, and, and the words also are just really wonderful for our Lenten walk as we, uh, as we approach Easter. So I'll encourage us to do that if you're uh, looking for a new, uh, really good song. Keith Getty. Keith and Kristen Getty. You're familiar maybe with their song, you know, In Christ Alone. They wrote that song as well. So, uh, yeah, that's a wonderful song. I like to listen to it just for reflection and uh, meditation on, on the Word of God. Let's come to God now in our time of congregational prayer as we uh, lift our hearts up to God. Let's pray. Father God, we adore you. Holy Spirit, we adore you. Jesus Christ, we adore you. We come, Lord, triune God, worshiping you, knowing that you are a holy God. We remember, Lord, when the prophet Isaiah saw you in the temple and he came before you and he trembled, realizing that he was a man of unclean lips living amongst a people of unclean lips and how he was just so astounded that he could be in your presence. Lord, we stand with the same amazement and adoration of who you are, that you call us into your presence. That even though we are sinful, even though we are wrongdoers, even though, Lord, we rebel against you and have you, still say, come to me. Come into my presence. You call us, Lord, by name, each and every one of us. You know each and every one of us, and you call each and every one of us by our own name. You call us your children, your beloved children. We consider all of these things, Lord, and we think in this Lent season how unworthy we are, and even amidst that, Lord, how you have paid for us in, in, the, in the cross of Christ. We stand amazed, we stand beneath the cross of Jesus, amazed that you would forgive us, and amazed that you would love us even amidst our wrongdoing. We stand in the midst and the presence of your holiness, knowing that you, Lord, are so perfect and we are not. And for these things, we adore you. We come into your presence just acknowledging how great and wonderful you are. We come into your presence this morning recognizing that you love us, that you love us and you call us, and Lord, what a privilege it is to be here. 
whether we are worshiping here in this building or whether we are worshiping from home or whether uh, we are uh, worshiping you throughout the week. Lord, you have made your home in us through the Holy Spirit. Lord, we thank you for this presence and we thank you, Lord, that you uh, have come into our lives. For all these things, Lord, we adore you. Lord, as we adore you, we realize that uh, we have much to confess. Lord, sometimes we would rather listen to our own voices. Sometimes we would rather listen to our own thoughts. Sometimes, Lord, we would rather listen to the things of this world. Sometimes, Lord, we would rather listen to things which are not from you. We confess, Lord, that sometimes we are misguided. We confess, Lord, that we do not always follow your way and would rather go our own way. Lord, sometimes we would rather than being filled by your spirit of love and truth and forgiveness, rather be filled with other things, things maybe we're not proud of. Lord, we confess these things to you. We confess these things as individuals acknowledging to you that we are still sinners, that we are still imperfect. Lord, we pray that you would sanctify us, that is, make us more into the image of Christ. We thank you again for your forgiveness of our sins and that we can come and that we can confess our sins to you because you tell us that you forgive us under the cross of Christ. Lord, we thank you for so many things we thank you that as we confess our sins that you forgive us, that there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ and that the old is gone and the new is here, the new creation has come here within us as you have filled us with your spirit. The new creation, the new kingdom that you have established is here, even now in this church, in this place where we are a light to the world. Lord, we thank you for these gifts we thank you for the promises, Holy Spirit, that you give us. Jesus, we thank you for the gifts and the promises that you tell about the disciples, which we'll hear about in a little while. We thank you, Holy Spirit, for teaching us, for guiding us, for comforting us in times of trouble. Lord, we thank you for other wonderful things. We thank you for the opportunity to worship you here to worship you, uh, and not just here, but whether it's here or at home or, or in our, uh, throughout our weeks as we gather and talk and uh, glorify you wherever two or three are gathered, Lord, you are there. Lord, we thank you just for the promise of spring. We thank you for the sunshine as we wake up and it's not so dark outside anymore. We thank you, Lord, that we look forward to warmer weather this week. We thank you, Lord, for... Uh, for, for the promise of spring and the reminder that that is for us, the reminder that it gives us about life, the life that you offer, the new life that you offer, the life that is in you and the Holy Spirit in Christ, Father. Lord, we thank you for so many things. There are things that are on our hearts that only we individuals know. Lord, we raise those things up to you offering you thanks, knowing that you are the one who provides all of these good things. Lord, we come before you as people who need to rely on you, and people who are still needy. We are still, even though you are bringing your kingdom and the new creation has come in us, Lord, we still live in this intermediate time when we still experience the brokenness of this world. Lord, we pray for our leaders, our government. We pray for those who are guiding our country. Lord, we pray that you would uh, be with them, that you would put your spirit upon them. Lord, may they, uh, may they know you. May they be led by you and guided by you. Lord, we pray for our community. Uh, we thank you, Lord, for the opportunity we had this last week to uh, serve for the, our community through our Feeding America food truck. Lord, we thank you for that opportunity, and Lord, we pray that you would bless those opportunities. We pray, Lord, that people would see the work that is done here in the name of Christ, that they would be moved, and that they would know that this church, that the church is, the play, is a place where they can come with no condemnation and be embraced in love and forgiveness. 
Lord, we pray for those who have been affected still by the coronavirus, whether it's physically an illness or uh, whether it's economically or emotionally. Lord, it's taken such a toll on so many people. Lord, we pray boldly that uh, this would come to an end. We pray, Lord, that there would be an end to this, uh, to this pandemic and that, Lord, we could return to life less focused on these things and more focused on you. Lord, we pray for anyone this week who needs guidance, anyone who has unanswered questions. We pray, Lord, for anyone who is suffering, some, anybody who is suffering quietly. Lord, we pray for those whose pain is deep, whose pain only they and you know. Holy Spirit, we pray you would make your presence known in these lives. Fill us, Lord, with the comfort that you promise us. Lord, we thank you for the strong, vivid sense that you give us that you are with us through the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, we pray now that you would be with us as we, as we uh, hear your word. We pray, Lord, that you would open our minds and our hearts. Lord, we pray that you would guide us and lead us and teach us and comfort us and embolden us. We pray, Lord, that through the word that you give us, Lord Jesus, that you would give us comfort and peace and reassurance. We pray all of these things in Jesus' precious and holy name. Amen. So as we said, we're going to be going, or we are going through a series currently on, uh, on the last, or the, I guess the middle section of John. And these, this is the section where Jesus is giving what some call his farewell discourse. Again, the image is that Jesus is knowing that he's going to be going to the cross. And there's this, uh, this part of John, between John chapters 13 through 17, and Jesus is talking with his disciples, his friends. He's talking with them as, as he knows he's about to be taken away, and he's telling them these things that are so important that he really wants them to know. And this morning we'll be examining uh, a few sections of, of this, and the text is a little bit longer than uh, maybe we normally examine, but I'm going to invite you, I'm going to invite you to listen carefully because there are actually five times in this text, five times in this section where Jesus is going to mention the Holy Spirit. Five times he's going to tell the disciples about the Holy Spirit. And, you know, I don't know about you. I do this a lot. Maybe it's a bad habit, but I do this. When somebody, I'm talking with somebody on the phone or having a conversation, um, I've got a few family members here actually visiting this morning. Maybe they can tell you that. If I really want somebody to know that, know something that I'm trying to tell them, I have a habit. I actually go back and I repeat it. I repeat it sometimes at the end of a conversation, and that's because I think, well, if they, I really want them to know this. This is something I think is really important. And so, anyways, if I do that, now you know what I'm trying to do if I'm talking with you on the phone. <laughs> but uh, Jesus does this, though. He repeats this five times. He talks about the Holy Spirit five times in this text. And so I'll invite you to listen to this. Listen to this and listen if you can uh, pick up on the sections or the, the reference he's uh, referring to. So let's start in John chapter 14, starting in verse 15. And we'll go through verse 27 and then we'll jump over to John 15 verse 26. So John 14 verse 15. If you love me, keep my commandments, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever, the Spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him, neither it's because neither, it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans, I will come to you. Before long, the world will not see me anymore, but you will see me, because I live, you also will live. On that day, you will realize that I am in my Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. Whoever has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me. 
The one who loves me will be loved by my father, and I too will love them and show myself to them. Then Judas, not Judas Iscariot, said, But Lord, why do you intend to show us yourself, you show yourself to us and not to the world? And Jesus replied, Anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. My father will love them, and we will come to them and make our home with them. Anyone who does not love me will not obey my teaching. These words you hear are not my own. They belong to the Father who sent me. But all this I have spoken while still with you. But the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. Then jumping over to John 15, starting in verse 26. When the Advocate comes, who I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who goes out from the Father, he will also testify about me. And you also must testify, for you have been with me from the beginning. All this I have told you so that you will not fall away. They will put you out of the synagogue. In fact, the time is coming when anyone who kills you will think they are offering a service to God. They will do such things because they have not known the Father or me. I have told you this so that when their time comes, you will remember that I warned you about them. I did not tell you this from the beginning because I was with you, but now I am going to him who sent me. None of you asks, where are you going? Rather, you are filled with grief because I have said these things. But very truly, I tell you, it is for your good that I am going away. Unless I go away, the advocate will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. When he comes... He will prove the world to be in the wrong about sin and righteousness and judgment. About sin because people do not believe in me. About righteousness because I am going to the Father where you can see me no longer. And about judgment because the prince of this world now stands condemned. I have much more to say to you, more than you can bear now bear. But when he, the spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all the truth. He will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears, and he will tell you what is yet to come. He will glorify me because it is from me that he will receive what he will make known to you. All that belongs to the Father is mine. This is why I said the Spirit will receive from me what he will make known to you. This is the word of the Lord. So as you know, when I was a kid, I was, uh, I was a, a military child. My, my father was a, a military chaplain. And one of the things about your parent being in the military is that they go on deployment. Now, being on deployment, that's when, uh, that's when uh, whoever you're, uh, you're serving with goes off and is uh, the, the group they're stationed with or they work with uh, serves remotely. They serve remotely. They go and they, uh, they're going to go somewhere else away from usually their families and away from wherever it is that they normally serve. As you are a kid in the military, in a way, you, you, you know that this is a reality in life. You know it's a reality that your, your parent is going to go on deployment. And it's not something, at least not something I look forward to, because knowing that my dad was going to be going away for periods of time, whether it was three months or six months or nine months, it was always kind of painful. You always, as a kid, you want to be with your parent. Because your parent is a guide for you. A parent is somebody who uh, can be with you and shape you and love you and, and, and be with you. And when they're not there, that can be really hard. Now, as a kid, I always knew that my dad was going to be coming back at the per- end of that period, whenever that was, whether it was three months or six months or, or, or nine months, and maybe we'd have communication in between. But 
I always knew he was coming back, and that always provided me a bit of comfort, quite a bit of comfort, knowing he would be coming home at the end of his deployment. I think the disciples are looking at Jesus knowing that he's going away, but they're not sure he's coming back. They're not sure that he's coming back. Jesus is telling them, I'm about to leave. I'm about to leave, and for the disciples, without knowing what's going to really happen, not knowing if Jesus is coming back, not knowing where their friend and their guide and their leader is going, it's somewhat troubling for them. Jesus has been everything to these disciples. He's given them meaning. He's been with them. He's walked with them. He's been, he's been their friend, and he's, he's done everything for them. They've spent like three years, probably, walking with Jesus. Day in and day out. They cannot imagine life without Jesus. In John 16, verse 6, it seems that Jesus knows what they're feeling. It says, you are filled with grief. Jesus knows that his friends are going to miss him. And I have to imagine the disciples are a bit like children, a little bit like me, maybe, as my father was about to go out on deployment and be gone for a period of time. Jesus, who's going to guide us if you're gone? Jesus, you've been our whole life for the last three years. What what are we going to do without you, Jesus? Jesus, you can't leave us, and yet that's exactly what Jesus intends to do. He intends to go to the cross, and he will be crucified and buried, and they know he's going to die. And of course, eventually we know that he will ascend into heaven and be seated at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. But still, what about the disciples who are left behind? What are they supposed to do? We affirm that these are good and necessary truths, but the disciples are left nonetheless troubled. They're going to be by themselves, they think. And they don't want to be by themselves. I think Jesus knows that they need encouragement. I think Jesus knows that they shouldn't really be by themselves because in a way they are like children. They are like spiritual children who need guidance still. And Jesus, as part of this going away speech, he wants to give them some encouragement. It's interesting, actually, at the end of this speech, or part of the end of this speech, Jesus says, I have told you all of these things so that in me you may have peace. Even in our passage today, he said, I, my peace I leave with you. Now, I don't know about you, but if I was about to face these things and about to know that Jesus was going away, my good friend and the one who's guided me and led me all this time, and he says, my peace I leave with you, I would want to know, what do you mean by that, Jesus? How am I supposed to have peace? How am I supposed to feel good about this that you are leaving? What am I supposed to do? What am I supposed to do now that you are leaving, that you are going away and we are going to be left by ourselves, or so we think? So again, if I were the disciples, I would want to know that. If I were me, I would want to know that as I live in this world full of complication and full of turmoil and full of pain and coronavirus and political upheaval. And if I were me, I would want to know, how am I supposed to have peace in all of this, Jesus? And if you're not here by my side to tell me exactly what I'm supposed to do, what am I supposed to have, Jesus? How am I supposed to have this peace, the sense of well-being, even as you are gone? I think Jesus gives two answers for them and for us about how we're supposed to have some semblance of peace, and not just some semblance of peace, but real peace. One of them we're going to talk about this week, and one of them we'll talk about next week. The one we'll talk about next week is about being connected with Jesus. But before being connected with Jesus, I think we have to have a good sense of what Jesus is talking about with regards to the Holy Spirit. That the Holy Spirit is an answer to prayer. The Holy Spirit is an answer for the disciples. The Holy Spirit is a real presence in their lives. And so the Holy Spirit, that's what we're going to delve into a little bit today. What Jesus tells us in these texts about the Holy Spirit. And not just ambiguous things. Jesus gives the disciples very specific ways in which the Holy Spirit will be with them. And those are also true for us. 
So a few things about the Holy Spirit before uh, that uh, we believe about the Holy Spirit. We have the Nicene Creed, which says we believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life. He proceeds from the Father and the Son, and with the Father and the Son is to be worshipped and glorified. There's this sense, even as Jesus is talking about the Holy Spirit, and uh, in this passage, Jesus says in chapter 14, verse 23, which we read, we will come and make a home in you. Jesus also says in John 14, verses 18 through 20, if the Holy Spirit is in them, that the, the Holy Spirit is going to teach them the things that Jesus has already taught them. The sense that Jesus wants them to know is that the Holy Spirit is Jesus with them. Now we proclaim the mystery of the Trinity, of, of the mystery of the Trinity, that is the triune God. We have the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, three persons yet one. The sense that, we'll, uh, that, we, uh, that we express in this mystery is that the, the Trinity, each person of the Trinity is so intimately connected that if one is with us, they're all with us. The Holy Spirit being with us is just like Jesus being with us and with the disciples. Jesus wants the, the disciples to know this, so we're going to delve into that a little bit. There are five passages... Oh, I just gave away the answer. I asked you to count them. Did anybody come up with five times when Jesus mentions the Holy Spirit? That was the right. Okay, good. Somebody did. Yeah, five times. Oh, I was supposed to ask you that. All right. Well, five times. And th these uh, five times where Jesus goes into the, talking about the Holy Spirit, uh, they're, they're on the email. If you got the, uh, the, the announcement email uh, last night, that... Uh, those, uh, the, on those questions that I provide, these passages are outlined specifically, but I'll give them to you now if you want to write them down. The five passages are John 14, verses 15 through 17, John 14, verses 25 through 26, John 15, verses 26 through 27, John 16, verse 7 through 11, and then 16, verses 12 through 15. So, Jesus is talking about the Holy Spirit, and he's telling the disciples all of this information about the Holy Spirit in order to provide them peace and reassurance. Now, I want to note about this that this is one of the uh, possibly deepest sections of Scripture. It's a really, really deep, really theological, really meaningful uh, section. We could spend a long, long time on this small section of scripture. And what I'm going to try to do this morning, and maybe at a later date we can dive, well, I'd love to dive more into it, but what, does, uh, what do, are the main teachings that Jesus wants his disciples to know about the Holy Spirit? What are the main things that Jesus wants the disciples to know? What does he leave them with? And we'll, ex we'll explore some of that and what that means for us. I think the first thing if you look at our outline, that's number one. The first thing, one of the things that Jesus wants the disciples to know is that the Holy Spirit is a teacher. The Holy Spirit is a teacher. We see him referred to as the Spirit of Truth. And that uh, the Holy Spirit will teach the disciples things that Jesus has taught them. In John 14, verse 26, Jesus says, The Holy Spirit will help them to remember what Jesus taught. Again, Jesus is going away. He's going to be crucified. He's going to be physically apart from his disciples. He's going to ascend into heaven. Jesus wants them to know that he is not leaving them alone, that he wants them to continue to learn. Jesus wants the disciples to continue to grow in their knowledge of who Jesus is and what Jesus has done. Jesus wants the disciples to know that he's going to provide somebody, the Holy Spirit, to teach them, to lead them, and to guide them. We see this in John 14, verse 17, and 14, verses 25 and 26, and 16, verses 13 through 15. Each of those is really delving into what the Holy Spirit will do and he will teach them about who Jesus is. We see this later, actually, in the book of John, in, first, or in the book of First John, also written by the author of John. In First John 2, verse 27, the author of John says, His anointing will teach you about all things. 
there's this sense that the Holy Spirit, that God is giving us the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit will continue to teach the disciples and make clear what Jesus has already taught them. And the same is true for us, I think, that Jesus gives us the Holy Spirit, a very real presence, a very real teacher who is to guide us and lead us in our daily lives. The Holy Spirit is the person of the Trinity who is within us and who is guiding us, who has made our, his home within us, as Jesus says. I think there's a sense that God wants us to continue to grow in our faith, to continue to grow in the knowledge of who Jesus is, to continue to grow in our walk and our relationship with God himself. And the Holy Spirit is the one who does that for us and with us. He is our guide and our teacher. So that's the first thing that I think Jesus broadly highlights, that the Holy Spirit is the teacher. The second thing that Jesus talks about is that the Holy Spirit will expose. The Holy Spirit will expose now, and if we look at the book of John in our, in, our, in our reading from the day, there's chapter 16, verses 8 through 9. If you have your Bibles, turn to that. John 16, verses 8 through 9. Jesus says about the Holy Spirit, When he comes, he will prove the world to be in the wrong about sin and righteousness and judgment about sin because people do not believe in me, about righteousness because I am going to the Father where you can see me no longer, and about judgment because the prince of the world now stands condemned. Some translations have the word convict in there, that the Holy Spirit will convict the world about sin and righteousness and judgment. And for me, I think I like the word expose a little bit better. In Greek, the word is kind of to bring to light or to uncover. The Holy Spirit will uncover that which is sinful, and he will uncover the wrongdoing in the world. There's a sense that when the Holy Spirit comes into the world that the darkness will be revealed. I think there's a sense that uh, if we look earlier in the book of John, in John 3 verse 19, Jesus talks about how the world loved the darkness. The world loved the darkness. The world would rather live in the darkness. Actually, the world would rather stay covered up, unexposed. It would rather remain hidden. Look, if you want to, John 3, verse 19, the world loved the darkness. There's a song, and it's a classic rock song, and maybe you've heard it. The great Billy Joel sings in his song, uh, was it only the good die young? And he says, I'd rather... Laugh with the sinners than, does anybody know the next line? I'd rather laugh with the sinners than die with the saints because sinners are much more fun, is what he says. I think there's a sense that people would rather live in the darkness. Sinners are much more fun. Nobody raised their hand. Nobody listens to Billy Joel. All right. <laughs> I won't sing it for you. Maybe I shouldn't sing along in the car, but it's a song that I think reveals a little bit about the darkness in the world, that we'd, people would rather laugh with the sinners than die with the saints because the sinners are much more fun, and only the good die young is what he says. I think that Jesus tells the disciples the world isn't going to like it when the darkness is exposed. When the Holy Spirit exposes the darkness, I'll ask you to raise your hand if you like being told you're wrong. Nobody? All right, I'll keep that in mind. Yeah, we don't like being told we're wrong, and I don't think the world likes it when it's un the darkness is uncovered and exposed. And yet there's the sense that Jesus is giving to the disciples and to us that that's exactly what the Holy Spirit will do. And maybe it makes us even a little bit more uncomfortable when Jesus tells us that it's our job, actually, through the Holy Spirit, that the Holy Spirit works through each and every one of us to uncover that darkness. I think there's a sense that the Holy Spirit will work uh, in individual lives and does work in individual lives, but I think there's also the sense that the Holy Spirit teaches each and every one of us, and 
we then go into the world and uncover the darkness. We are bearers of truth, bearers of the truth about who Jesus is and bearers of the truth about what God is doing. I think when the Holy Spirit works within us, that is what happens. We go into the world and we share about the truth, but the world probably won't like that. And Jesus tells us that, tells us that after exposing the world, there's, an, there's a consequence for that. And this is, I think, the third part or the third uh, thing that Jesus tells the disciples about that the Holy Spirit will do. And the Holy Spirit will support will support because when the disciples go into the world, it tells Jesus tells them the world is gonna not it's not gonna like this. People won't like this stuff. I should also mention that I think when we go into the world and when we share the truth and uncover darkness, I think there's the sense that we are supposed to do this in love and gentleness. But I think there's also a sense that no matter how loving and gentle we do it, it's going to be uncomfortable. But Jesus tells the disciples that the world will not like this. He's going to testify about who Jesus is and about the truth, but the world is going to not like that. And in that moment when the world, when the darkness has been exposed and the darkness is seen and the world is rebelling because of the darkness that's been uncovered and they don't like that, we're going to need support. The disciples will need support for what to do and what to say. Jesus says this in John 14, verses 16 through 17, And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him. Also, as we go down to chapter 15, verses 8 through 11, That the world is going to, uh, the world is going to, uh, is going to just not like the darkness being uncovered. We also see places now. There's there's this word here that Jesus uses. It's not a word that I think we typically use in our everyday language. In John chapter 14, verse 16, he says, "The advocate will come for you." The advocate. The advocate. Now, in Greek, this word is actually a compound word. It's two words that have been put together. It's a word that is, we, it's a word we would in English say paraclete. The word para means to come alongside. That's where we get our word parallel. And kletos means something that is called alongside or to call out. The sense is the Holy Spirit is somebody who will come alongside of the disciples and will speak for and help. In a way, actually, in Jesus' culture, the word paraclete is used to describe a lawyer. The word is used to describe a lawyer, somebody who will come alongside and speak and help you and support you in your times of difficulty when you need help speaking. We see in uh, the book of Luke, and in Matthew, Luke 12, verse 12, Matthew 10, verses 17 through 20, Jesus says, Don't worry about when you will go before the authorities and when they question you, for at that time you will be given the Holy Spirit, and he will tell you what to say. I think that's the sense that we're supposed to have, that the disciples are supposed to have, that the Holy Spirit is coming alongside and supporting and telling them what to say, and for us as well. In those moments of difficulty, when we are wondering what to do, when we are feeling left on our own, when we are struggling, or when we aren't sure what to say, or when we want to evangelize and share the gospel, but we're not quite sure what words to come out, we're not left on our own. We're not left on our own to speak on our own. Rather, Jesus says, don't worry, I am sending you a paraclete, somebody to come alongside you, to support you, and someone who not just is going to expect you to tell your own information, the information which you've somehow come up with. No, the Holy Spirit wants to teach you and guide each and every one of us deeper and deeper into the truth of God and what Jesus has done for us. That, those are the roles of the Holy Spirit, not exclusively. There are more, but these are the three that Jesus is telling the disciples, I want you to know about these things. 
that the world won't like what we have to say and we will need support during those times. And we shouldn't just go out on our own saying whatever we want to say, but rather we need to rely on the Holy Spirit who lives within us. But in order to realize all of these things, I think it means that we need to have a very real relationship with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, God, Jesus himself, are not far away and distant. The Holy Spirit, God, Jesus, are not on deployment somewhere else. They have not left us as children. Rather, they have come and made their home with us. The Holy Spirit has come and made his dwelling within us and has promised to stay with us and to teach us and to support us and expose us as we go, expose the world as we go into it, as we share the good news that the darkness is not the way to live, but we would rather walk as children of light. I think all of this requires nurturing the relationship. As you know, I've often, uh, sometimes I've made connections to our very earthly relationships. When you have an, a relationship that's only one-sided, usually it's not very healthy. If you only have one person who is pouring into and spending time and energy in a relationship, usually that relationship isn't going to last very long, or at least it's going to be difficult. Certainly it's going to be difficult to hear each other and support each other in times of great need. I think the same is true with the Holy Spirit. We're supposed to have a, a, a mutual relationship with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit so desperately wants to be in relationship with us to, and is living within us and and we're called to nurture that relationship. Certainly, we do this in, in prayer. We do this in worship. We do this uh, in the classic spiritual disciplines. In a way, that's what fasting is about that I mentioned earlier. Fasting is a way to nurture and deepen and strengthen our relationship with God. The Holy Spirit is with us always, which means God is with us always. The importance is that we are always nurturing this relationship. And when we do, I think God will allow, will, will, the Holy Spirit will make these things possible that Jesus lays out, that he will teach us, that he will strengthen us and support us. But I think that requires us to have a good relationship and to spend time in prayer because it's a wonderful gift that God is giving us something that he desperately wants for us, that we will not be left alone and by ourselves as the disciples are fearful of. We're not left alone. The Holy Spirit is very really with us and in us. So some passages to consider. Those ones I mentioned earlier, John 14, verses 15 through 17. John 14, verses 25 through 26. John 15, verses 26 through 27. 16, verses 7 through 11. And 16 verses 12 through 15. Those are the five times when Jesus mentions the Holy Spirit. As you read those, what are the ways, what are some things that you notice that Jesus is teaching about the Holy Spirit? What does Jesus want the disciples to know? And then Jesus also indicates that the disciples and us are, will face opposition as the world, as we go into the world and share the good news about Jesus, that the world would rather live in the darkness, they'd rather live with the, laugh with the sinners than die with the saints. Is that something that we expect as we go into the world? And if we do expect it, how do we understand the Holy Spirit to help us and guide us and shape us in those moments of difficulty? And then finally, what are some things that I can do to nurture my relationship with the Holy Spirit. What is that, how is that good for me? Not just as a, uh, not just as a spiritual devotion to God, not just, as, uh, not just as worship and praise to God, but very really, you know, how does that benefit me? That maybe sounds selfish, but I think Jesus is giving the Holy Spirit to, for us. How does this benefit and bless me, according to what Jesus has said? As we go into this week, I guess I would encourage us, just as a very simple practice, something that somebody earlier uh, or recently uh, encouraged me to do, but throughout your week, do you ever just stop and say, Holy Spirit, what are you saying to me now? Holy Spirit, what should I do now? If we stop and we listen, what will the Holy Spirit tell us 
How will we be guided and led? How will we be comforted and supported? What truth will he teach us about our faith? As we go into next week and prepare, I mentioned there are two things that Jesus gives the, to the disciples, and I think the Holy Spirit is key to the second, that is connection with Jesus. Jesus is going to want the disciples to know the importance of connecting and staying and being in Christ. So as we reflect on that, we consider that, and let's reflect on those things in this coming week to have a very real connection with Christ and what does our relationship with the Holy Spirit look like? Because God wants us to have that. God wants us to be connected and to learn and to be supported. It's a gift, the Holy Spirit, a gift from God that we are not left alone, but are comforted and encouraged. Let's pray. Holy Spirit, we thank you for your word and your promises. We thank you, Holy Spirit, that you teach us and that you empower us to go lovingly and boldly and truthfully and gracefully into this world, that as we do, you will expose the darkness. I pray, Lord, that as we, as we do these things, that you would continue to teach us and comfort us and tell us, Lord, what to say in our times of difficulty. As we go through times of difficulty and moments of despair, maybe, or moments of extreme difficulty, we pray, Holy Spirit, that you would bring us the peace which Jesus talks about, the peace which you promised to give us, Holy Spirit. We pray that you would comfort us and teach us and nurture us and guide us and make us bold and truthful and full of love. I pray all of these things in Jesus' precious and holy name. Amen. Before our time of singing, I invite you to rise in body or in spirit to receive God's blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his face towards you and give you his peace. Amen.